Good morning, saints, and welcome to the Ebenezer UMC's Sunday Worship Service. My name is Jasmine Renee Thomas, and I am blessed with the opportunity to welcome you all in this morning. I want to take a quick break, just a couple seconds, so you can invite others to join in on this worship experience with you and with us. Down below in the comments, you should see a link to this video right here that's running live on Facebook, live on YouTube, and also on Zoom. Go ahead and share that link with a friend, text it to someone, paste it on your wall. You can hit that arrow with share underneath on Facebook in order to do that. But invite others in. For the Lord our God says, when two or more are gathered in his name, he is here with us. So let's invite him on in. I'll give you just a couple more seconds to do that. All right, and welcome back, friends. Once again, this is The Ebenezer UMC. You can find us on all social media platforms at, at The Ebenezer UMC. Feel free to follow us here on Facebook, on YouTube, and again, invite others to join in. Please enjoy the worship service today. And if you feel like getting up and clapping and singing, please get up and clap and sing. If you feel like writing amen in the comments, there are folks from our communications ministry waiting to connect with you today. Write in the comments, send us an email, and that email address will be in the comments, or let us know anything that we can help you out with through our communications card. We are so excited to worship with you this morning. Let's get ready in our mind, our soul, and our hearts for prayer. Dear God, our hearts are broken for this world. The hatred is palpable, the division undeniable, and the pain runs deep. We desperately need more of you. We ask for your truth to be louder than the noise which surrounds us, for your mercy to be stronger than the voices of oppression for your strength to overpower those who seek to do harm. Where there is division, bring unity. Where there is anger, bring peace. Where there is evil, bring victory. Empower us to fulfill your mission, to answer your calling, to be the light you've created us to be. May your love your grace and your mercy flood this world. We love you. We seek you. We place our hope in the mighty name of Jesus. This we pray.
morning to you saints. I would like to thank you so much for worshiping with us today at Ebenezer. And I am excited about what God has in store for us. Just before we start, though, I want to share a couple of announcements with you that I think are important and certainly um, important for you to hear. On next Saturday, August 21st at 8.30 a.m., I am asking all of the men, able bodies, who can come and be of some help to our trustees. Um, you can reach out to Gary Collins. Let us know if you're able. We'll be doing some things around the church and need your help. There are some things that need to be cleaned out as we prepare um, to get ready to complete the final stages of all of the work that's been done. So if you could, please be available Saturday, August 21st at 8.30 a.m., at Ebenezer. Um, I know you guys will have a great time fellowshipping. You may find some lunch or breakfast provided. Um, so um, show up if you can. Bring somebody with you. I also want to invite you to stop by the church today between 12 and 1 to pick up your Sunday school books. If you haven't already done so, Wanda's online now. You can reach out to her. Let her know that you need a Sunday school book. But you can come by Ebenezer United Methodist Church today if you're already um, signed up to participate in Sunday school or even if you're an interested in joining the Sunday school class. So please do so. A quick celebration of God, um, God's continued faithfulness. We hosted um, vaccine, excuse me, immunizations on Monday, two Mondays ago, with in partnership with the Texas Children's Hospital and Church and Community Health Initiative through the Texas Annual Conference. We had a great turnout. Families were blessed. It just warmed my heart to see all of the families come to receive this service. And that's what we want to be. We want to be light in the community and make um, resources available and accessible um, to those who are in need. So I thank you. I know that our outreach ministry and our United Methodist Women's Ministry are working on school supplies and uniforms to as we help families and students and particularly our partner school, Burris Elementary prepare to head back to school. Now, saints, I've shared those things with you, and I'm prayerful that you will participate and send your prayers. If you can't be there, um, if you can't be there present to send your prayers and your gifts, however you can and however God nudges you, I invite you to do so. Now, let's get to the word today. Let's turn our attention and our hearts towards God's word. Our text today is going to be from Matthew 6, 25, 34. Hear now these words from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet... Your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This is the word of God for the people of God. And the people of God all over type and say, Thanks be to God. Let's pray. 
Lord God, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your word that reminds us that, God, we don't have to worry, that we can cast our cares and our worries upon you, oh God, that you would bear that burden. You are the burden bearer. So we thank you, God, for lifting our load and making it light and easy for us, oh God. We thank you, Lord God, that we can trust you in unusual circumstances during um, unusual times, Lord. We trust you. God, knowing that you will provide all that we need, even when we can't see it, and even when we don't know how it will be done, God, you will provide. Build our straight, strengthen our faith. Build our understanding of you, oh God. Less of me and more of you. None of me and all of you. Holy Spirit, guide us, lead us, transform us. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Three times in this passage, Jesus says to the disciples, do not worry. And we can gather from such emphasis, emphasis that this is important to Jesus. And so saints, it should be important to you and me. And for some of us, just the mere thought of hearing the words, do not worry, triggers a list of things that we are already worried about. You know, I found it both intentional and fascinating that when you read verses 20 through 24 of Matthew chapter 6, that the teachings of Jesus on do not worry is preceded by Jesus' teaching on the love of money and that you can't serve two masters, God and money. And Jesus tells us you will come to love one and despise the other. And what a faith challenging time it is to be reminded of these words from Jesus, particularly during these times when it become, when it seems that we have plenty of things that we could be worried about. I mean, we see the constant rise in COVID cases and people resisting and rebelling against safe practices that can protect others by simply wearing a mask or getting vaccinated. I mean, the impact and fallout from COVID seems to just keep coming and getting a little too close for comfort and continues to wreak havoc on our communities and our family and friends and now even the smallest babies. And in all of that, many are preparing um, for children of all ages to head back to school classroom settings with unpredictable environments, college students are heading away to school for the first time, some are returning um, for another time or another year off away. I mean, this is the peak season and it is a lot going on. And it seems like there's so much to be worried about. I mean, think about hurricane season. But these three words, do not worry, seem to stand in stark contrast to the environment and context that many are facing in today's time and even during this scripture. And it's no different for us today, saints. So hearing Jesus in Matthew saying, do not worry, is a call to action for believers in Christ to once again not place your hope in the tangible or in the things that can distract you from staying focused on Christ. It's in this passage, saints, that Jesus calls our attention back away from being centered and focused on culture on materialism, on consumerism, and redirects us toward Christ. It's time to retire your idea of status and wealth and stop being driven and motivated by what's trending and what's trendy. We cannot, we absolutely cannot be people who place their hopes and motivations in keeping up with culture because it will have you chasing all the right all the wrong things, all the wrong people for all the wrong reasons. So what I'm, what I'm trying my best to convey, saints, and I hope you hear my heart in this, but what I'm trying to com my best to conv convey is that for, as people of God, we must be less culture-focused and centered and more kingdom-focused. We ought to be motivated by what is pleasing to God and be motivated by what God has called us to learn and operate with a kingdom mindset while seeking the things of God and not the things of this world. See, the text says that seek 
his kingdom first and all these things will be added unto you. The nugget is what you prioritize. The word does not say go out and try to consume all the things on your own or by yourself and then pursue God. The word instructs us to seek God first. In fact, the word says seek his kingdom and his righteousness first. That word seek in this text, particular text, translates to strive for and to aim for. And we have to make God our priority. See, God already knows what your every need is, and it is God who will make the provision for you. I know we try our best to help God out, and we just want to be good helpers, and I, I get it. I get it. But that's not what God said. <laughs> you see, what you prioritize is what becomes your treasure. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so to spend all of your energy and efforts and resources trying to obtain earthly goods for yourself may become a distraction from seeking righteousness and justice in the world. Jesus challenges us to trust God for our daily bread and our daily needs. I tell you what, no matter how many surveys and studies I look at or read about and research on about anxiety and worry and depression, they all have some very familiar and similar root causes and attributes. Most of them um, all show that triggers for worry and anxiety are functional and dysfunctional relationships. Its triggers are jobs or work environments or a lack of employment and worried about how are you going to make ends meet. And most are set off by finances, family, food scarcity, and health concerns. And even throughout this text, Jesus points to food, clothing, and shelter as being sources of worry in life. But here is where we can be encouraged. Three times again, I will remind you, three times Jesus says to his disciples in the text, do not worry. Whenever Jesus repeats something in the same text, it is a strong indication um, that what is being said is very important. And it's something for you not only to just hold on to or take note of, but for you to grab hold of. So Jesus says, do not worry three times. Friends, this is not a suggestion. In the same text, he tells us not to worry. He reminds us in verse 32 that your heavenly father knows what you need. You see, it's not Jesus. It's not that Jesus is saying these things are not important. That's not what's happening here. These things are real and valid concerns and needs. But Jesus is telling you that when you chase after him, he is the one who adds and provides your needs. Do not worry about what you will eat in um, chapter 6, verse 25, does not mean that food is unimportant. But what it is, it's redirecting followers of Christ, and followers of Jesus Christ, that they should pray for daily bread but then trust God to provide it. Let me say it another way. Worldly mindsets focus on our situation or our lack or our concerns or our losses and our hurts. But kingdom-minded people, kingdom mindsets focuses on our faith and the source, not the provision saints, but the source. Kingdom mindsets trust that God can and will provide. And Jesus sits down with his disciples on a mountainside in an intimate setting and reveals to them in this text what it means to follow him and to be a part of the kingdom of God. And he's teaching them on what it means to have a kingdom mindset. And in this text, he confidently tells them three times again, I say, not to worry. And he tells them that the pagans and the hypocrites are the ones who put their trust in the world. But you, you as followers of Christ, your trust and faith is to be placed in Christ and Christ alone. You ought not think like the rest of the world. You should be different. 
You should be different than those who have no knowledge of God. You should be different of those who have no hope, who have no trust, who have no faith, and who have no relationship with God. You should be different. But if I can be just transparent with you for a moment, I have to admit, saints, that these words do not worry, left me a little awestruck, especially when I think about all of the things that are happening right now in the world and even in the state that we can find ourselves in, wrestling with how we can be convinced of this word of hope and faith when we find ourselves in such desperate state. And yet, in all of that, Jesus says, do not worry about it. It just doesn't seem to make sense. It just doesn't add up. Don't worry about the realities of our situation, the state of our pain, the circumstances. It Saints, it just doesn't add up. I can't be the only one, right? But we are not to worry despite the state we may be dealing with. Let me say that again. We are not, we are to not worry despite the state we may be dealing with. And then the Holy Spirit really convicted me and reminded me of this. Don't consider the state, but consider the source. I'll say it again. Don't consider the state, but consider the source. Followers of Christ, don't give way to the state of your circumstances, but rather consider the source of your help, the source of your life, and the source of who God is. Consider the promises of God and consider that the source of the words do not worry are straight from the mouth of Jesus. When you consider the source of the command, you will learn and see that the directive do not worry has much power, has much certainty, has much authority, and has much assurance. But you have to consider the source. Let me tell you why this leaped in my spirit. You see, when I was in college, I studied journalism and communications in, in undergrad at Texas Southern University. And I was also the editor-in-chief of our campus newspaper, The Herald. And one of the things that I learned as a journalism student and as an editor and even as a reporter for a local newspaper was that before you published any news article, <clears throat> before you published any interview, before you published any story of what you have, you had to do two things. One, you had to vet the story, meaning checking all the facts, find witnesses um, to corroborate or verify the story and information, check for accuracy and patterns of behavior. And two, you always had to check the source. Everything would hinge and rise and fall upon the validity, the credibility, the trustworthiness of the source. And it's the same thing in seminary. When you do your exegetical work and cross-reference for context and clarity and uh, word origin and all of the true meaning, you have to check the source. And so since today, I want to invite you to consider the source. Consider the source of the one who says, do not worry. To get a better understanding of do not worry, we need to vet the source. So when I flip back um, to chapter five in my Bible to see where these words stem from, the beginning of this Sermon of the Mount, and verse one says, now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. See, right there, the scripture tells me all I need to know to attribute Jesus as the source of information. He began to teach them. So we know that Jesus is who said, do not worry in this teaching. Well, my second question would be, well, how credible is the word of Jesus? <laughs> well, just having a basic understanding of the Bible and the word of God, I know that if it's written in the scriptures that it must be true and it must be from God because according to 2 Timothy 3.16, that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. <laughs> so I know that I can trust the source because Hebrews 
6.18 tells me that it is impossible for God to lie. And just in case you wondered if I changed sources, I will remind you that Jesus is the Son of God. And in our Trinitarian theological understanding, God is God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus is incarnate, God wrapped in flesh. Don't take my word for it. I'm just trying to help you track down the source, saints. Right there in your Bible, the book of John, verses 1, um, chapter 1, verse 14 says, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and the only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. That's right, and truth. Listen, Jesus is full of truth. I want to tell you today, saints, that you can trust the source. See, when Jesus instructs the disciples that it can be trusted, <clears throat> even when it sounds like it's possible or doesn't even make sense. And I know sometimes, saints, we often need real examples. Even after we go through some things, we need other examples. And our faith is strengthened when we see the hand of God move in our life or witness God move and work in someone else's lives. And so when I just continue to spend a little bit more time with the source, and now I am convinced that the words coming out of Jesus's mouth are indeed credible and will not lead me down a path that would put me to shame. Now that I know who said, do not worry, if you are like some other people, I know you may want to check some references. <laughs> and to check references, I have to rely on actual firsthand accounts of events that have happened. In other words, who else witnessed Jesus say something and then do something <laughs> when he said he would do it? I just want to bet the sorts this morning, saints, because the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the, the deliverer, the provider, the creator is instructing us not to worry. So when I go back to my source, when I go back to the Bible to look for references and past experiences and all throughout scripture, I'm just overwhelmed and overcome and just blown away about the findings that are in the text. You see, I'm reminded of all the times that Jesus provided for the poor. I read about um, people with lifelong and life-threatening illnesses being healed. I learn about the dead who have been raised and brought to life. I see demons tremble and being cast out. I read about the chains being broken, people being delivered and set free. I see miracles happening like water being turned into wine. I see nothing being wasted and everything be pur pur um, purpose. I see a, a multitude being fed before they even ask for food. Saints, I don't know about you, but I'm just trying to consider the source this morning. You see, I see a Christ that is the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. I see a God who is strength for the weak, a savior for the sinners, an encourager for the hurting, a teacher for the eager. I see the bread of life, the chief cornerstone, the great high priest, our hope, our redeemer, our wonderful counselor, our mighty God, our everlasting father, our prince of peace, the perfecter of my faith. Saints of God, have you considered the source? Now, by all accounts, Jesus Christ is a source of all things good and new. He's been vetted. He's been tried. He's, he is true. Make it make sense, Pastor. See, it's a testament that you can begin, that you can depend on the word of God and that the words of Christ are absolute and true. God's word does not, cannot, and will not fail. When I consider the source, I am convinced that when Jesus says, do not worry, that I can trust that Jesus means do not worry. I don't need the Hebrew translation for that. You see, I can trust that all of my needs have been met. I can trust that God will provide. I can trust that it will work out for my good. I can trust that God has a plan and a solution for my situation. I can trust that my ways are not his ways and my limited thoughts are not his infinite thoughts. I can trust that God's timing will be my blessing. I can trust that when God would send his word, that it would accomplish what the Lord desires and achieves for the purpose for which the Lord sent it. I can trust that nothing, that my nothing is something to God. I can trust that God loves me and his word said that if he takes care of the birds and the flowers, that he will surely take care of me. And when I don't have all the answers, I still have God. 
And when I know that when it's all God, it's all good. And it's always good when it's all God. <laughs> Saints, you must cling to the true incredible source of God when you find yourself battling and succumbing to fear, anxiety, weariness, or being worried. <laughs> See, worrying robs and takes from you. It impacts your health in negative ways and adds no value to your life. It can cause heart failure, depression, separation, isolation, debt, high blood pressure, you know all of the things that worrying can do. Nothing good comes out of worrying. There is not a single thing about worrying that is life-giving. Even the text, even in the text we read today, God says, Jesus says, can it add a single hour to your life? No, but you know who can add a single hour to your life? You got it, God. <laughs> Listen, Proverbs 12, 25 says, anxiety weighs down the heart. And I ask you again to consider the source. Who or what is the source of your anxiety? Who or what is the source of your frustration, of your anger, of your hurt, of your pain, of your unforgiveness? I tell you who it's not. It's not God. Who is the source? What is the source? Get some help with whatever that is. Work that thing out and get your healing. Reveal it so that it can be healed. Ask God to reveal it so God can heal it. God adds to our lives. And this text calls for us to be reminded that God sees us and cares for us. So Ebenezer, as followers of Christ, as disciples of Christ, as students of God's word and teachings, where is our work in this text? Where is the transformation in our own lives? Where is the application and what's different about it? What do we take away and how does this word call us to be different and why is it important? Think about it. If Jesus in this moment is talking with the disciples and having to encourage them not to worry about the everyday cares of life, then how can the disciples be expected to trust God for the greater moments and the greater movements in the world? You will remember throughout the book of uh, Matthew, that the writer always makes a point to emphasize or point out the lack of faith shown by the disciples. But through that, through that transparency, through that vulnerability, we are given a particular insight into real struggles and challenges that the disciples are experiencing and in some ways helps us see our own selves and growth opportunities. We're not immune to making mistakes. We're not immune to not being in moments where we question what, uh, where our faith seems little, but God is challenging us to not worry. And in this text on Philippians 4, 6, 7, it says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. As people of God, remember, don't consider the state, but consider the source. Amen. Friends, I pray that this word has blessed you and has been food for your soul and a seed for your heart. I invite you to be sensitive about discerning how the Holy Spirit is nudging you to respond today. Don't just dismiss it so quickly. I pray that on this day that you make the decision to accept Jesus Christ in your heart and decide to have a relationship with Christ that will last for an eternity because you can trust the source. If that's you and you want to accept Christ today for the first time, I invite you to declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. 
And if you want to rededicate your life to Christ, please let us know. I want you to know that if you're looking for a church home or looking for a faith community to live out um, um, your Christian walk, we invite you to be a part of Ebenezer. We're a faith community who loves God, loves people, loves our community, try to do the right thing. We are church filled with broken, imperfect people. If you're looking for perfect people at Ebenezer, I'm going to have to guide you to another street, uh, church up the street. But we are a church filled with broken, imperfect people who are chasing a perfect God. And our hearts are chasing God. So I invite you today to respond on the connection card, either using the link in the chat or you can send me a DM or reply in the chat. If you want us to pray for you, share that as well. We want to be on this faith journey with you. Saints, don't forget, always consider the source. Now, friends, let's continue our worship through our tithes and our offering. And I thank you in advance. I thank you in advance and I thank God for you, for your faithfulness to God and the ministry and the work of Ebenezer as we continue to press toward the higher mark. Saints, it's now time for us to worship through our giving. Malachi 3.10 says, Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Friends, this is the God we serve. I praise God for his outpouring upon us and we are so thankful for your continued faithfulness and desire to see the ministry of Ebenezer continue to grow and do the work that God has called us to do. So don't stop praying, don't stop giving, and don't stop serving. We need you and the precious gifts that God has placed within you and has placed you to be a blessing to others. As a reminder, there are three ways to safely and securely give to Ebenezer. You can give online through the Tithely link, which will be in the comment section, or download the Tithely app and search for Ebenezer United Methodist Church. It's easy to give, it's an easy app to use, and it's easy to set up recurring um, gifts and automatic drafts. I know many of you will be on vacation this summer, so it's a good thing that you can already set up and don't have to worry about it. You can also give through Zelle using their email address, Ebenezer, U-M-C, finance at gmail.com. Again, that's Ebenezer, UMC finance at gmail.com or you can mail and drop your gifts off at 7312 North Main Street, Houston, Texas 77022. However you decide to give, we thank you. We're so grateful to you. Friends, would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for your steadfast love and mercy upon us. We are grateful and we are thankful and reminded that, Father, we believe that every word in the Bible was breathed out by you. And we believe your promise that you will bless us when we are obedient to your word. And so without hesitation, we give freely to you, God, reminded, being reminded that you give freely to us. And we thank you, Lord. Bless these tithes and offerings and gifts in however they manifest themselves. We thank you. We love you, Lord. We praise you. And may you be glorified in the work that we do. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. <music>